our talk title this morning is Listen to Yourself, meaning listen to the God within you. Listen to the voice of intuition that each and every one of us has. And the reason that we want to listen to it is because it is the most accurate source of life for each and every one of us. Despite the fact that many appearances may seem more overpowering, sometimes the little ego voices in our head are clamoring at a really high volume and a high frequency. And so we have to be very clear when we're listening to the voice of intuition within us, ourselves. I've noticed lately that I've been saying this statement, and so I thought to myself as it came up again this week, there's a reason. It may be just for me, it may be for you, and it may be for all of us. Who knows? But it fits perfectly with this also, and it is at least semi a, a Ernest Holmes quote. I didn't look it up. But it is, there's something within you that knows and knows that it knows. And it is that voice of intuition that knows. And when we have that knowing, we recognize it. So we come together every Sunday, having had different experiences of our week. Some of us may be saying, oh, my week was awesome and incredible. Some of us may say, ah, there was one low point. Some of us may say, oh, this was the worst week of my life. Some of us may have had losses, some of us gains, some of us got checks in the mail, while some of us are looking at our checking account going, uh-oh. Different experiences that we come together having had. And yet at the same time, absolutely knowing that each one has within that them that something called intuition, that God self, that knowing, that mind. And as we listen to it, it guides and directs us perfectly. It's when we don't listen to it that we go, uh-oh, instead of, eh, that's okay. So David has a great story that lines up perfectly with this idea of the importance of listening to our self. Well, maybe it's appropriate or maybe it's just irony that I would tell this story because most of you know that Deborah dresses me every week. <laughs> this is the story of Omar the tailor. There's a man who um, had a great opportunity to um, speak at a rather prestigious uh, engagement and as he was getting ready to do his talk he was looking through his closet trying to decide what am I going to wear and um, he looked at the suit and said well this old suit just doesn't quite measure up so he talked to his friend and his friend suggested you know what go see Omar the tailor he does miracles with fabrics and styles and fashions he's the perfect person for you to go to see so he went to see Omar the tailor, and he talked to Omar for a little bit, and Omar took his measurements, and they talked about fashion and style and fabric and so on, and the possibilities. And when they finally figured they pretty much had it all worked out, Omar says, okay, I got the basic idea, give me a few days, come back for a final fitting, and we'll be ready when you come back. So he came back a few days later with great anticipation. He walked into the shop, and there's Omar, and he pulls the suit off the rack. And it was absolutely gorgeous. It had his best fabric, and it had a real 100% silk <coughs> lining, and um, it was stitched to perfection. And he said, "Oh, I can't wait to try this on." So he goes in the dressing room, he puts on the suit, comes back out, stands in front of the mirror. He says, "Oh, this is wonderful." And Omar says, "Oh, yes, yes, that suit is perfect, absolutely perfect." He says, "What?" Well, he buttoned the jacket, and he noticed, well, my lapels seemed to kind of stick up a little bit. And he said, are these a little too long, or can we adjust this? And Omar says, oh, no, 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 no. The suit is absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. 
You know, people who wear suits like this are people of nobility, and people with a great, great sense of style and class. He says, to wear a suit like that, you have to embody the suit. You have to feel a sense of pride of ownership, personal pride. So just lift your chest and feel the pride swell in your chest. And while you're doing that, go ahead and lift your chin up a little bit too. And so that, that opening your chest would make you, give you a sense of pride. Lifting your chest would make you look like you're confident. And you'll be able to look down at the people around you so people will think you're very important. He lifted his head and looked down and lifted his chest and said, yes, this suit is absolutely beautiful. This is wonderful. But I noticed this sleeve over here seems to be a little long. He says, oh, the suit is perfect. The suit is absolutely perfect. You notice, do you ever notice pictures of portraits of people like um, Napoleon Bonaparte or the kings of England? They always stand with their arm like this. Because that shows, that curve shows a sense of elegance. And uh, it makes you look rich and prosperous. And, and if you stick out your elbow just a little bit like this, it shows, accentuates your bicep. That makes you look strong. It makes you look powerful. And so he stood there and he raised his chest and lifted his head and looked down and looked in the mirror and said, yes, I feel strong and powerful. This suit is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and Omar says, oh yes, that suit is perfect, absolutely perfect. And he says, but I do notice that this, my trouser leg seems a little bit longer than the other side. And Omar says, oh no, 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 no. The suit is perfect, absolutely perfect. He says, you notice the people who are rich and powerful quite often are great, greatly at leisure and are comfortable within themselves. So take a slight step back with your left foot and lean on that foot and put all your weight on that foot and you'll feel at ease, comfortable, at leisure. And then while you're doing that, move your front forward, foot forward of this event and point it in the, in the, in the front, in front of you because it looks like you're moving forward, moving into the future. So even though you're laid back and at comfort and at ease, your foot is moving into the future. So therefore, your, this suit makes the suit look timeless. He looked at himself and he puffed up his chest, lifted his head, put his arm up and stuck his elbow out and moved his feet forward. And he said, and he even gives you an opportunity to feel a little bit of swagger. And so he said, oh, this is absolutely wonderful. And Omar says, yes, that suit is perfect. Absolutely perfect. So he was so pleased. He looked at, looked at Omar and said, you know, I'm going to wear the suit. In fact, I think I'd like to wear it home. So he paid Omar. He walked out the front entrance. As he's walking down the street, meeting people. There are a couple of men walk by, and they say, oh, look, another beautiful suit by Omar. Omar, you know, he does wonders. He does miracles with fabric and design. And the other guy said, yes. And if you can make a, uh, a, uh, a creature like him look so well, think what he could do for me. <laughs> Okay, the moral of that story is he who trims himself to suit everyone else will soon whittle himself away. Yeah, and I noticed that time that I was kind of going like this too <laughs> in this culture. I guess I was a shopper in the store there. I think most of us can probably relate to being told what we want or how to do something from someone else. And maybe even times we listened or we had to listen. I know my father was famous for saying when I would go up to him as a teenager and say, um, may I go to my friend's house? He'd say, no, you don't want to do that. And I would always think to myself, well, how does he know what I want to do? Yes, I do or I wouldn't have asked. Well, the person that is getting the suit or whatever it is, needs to be bold enough to make their own decisions. And how do we do that? By listening to our own intuition. The self is our spiritual beingness. Each one of us has a unique and very personal relationship with the divine self or with God. We develop this relationship as we think God and think what God is for each one of us. We arrive, or we want to arrive, at the place 
where we are absolutely confident in what we believe. And we are so confident in what we believe about God, about life, about the way principles operate, that no one and nothing can shake us from that. And then we draw from this power. That's where we activate that divine intuition. We draw from this power to guide us through life. It will and does sustain us in our times of darkness. And it will uplift us to the highest idea imaginable in our own imaginings. We listen and trust ourself because we are aligned with that God self. We're firm in our personal idea that God is good and therefore life is good. Ernest Holmes wrote, there is no person's belief which can destroy our ideas unless we agree with such belief. Omar was willing to give up his power and to believe what someone else was okay. taking. Oh yes. Omar did not give up his power. Oh no, Omar took two powers. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the same is true for us. We can only lose our self, lower self, as we give up our own power. Within ourselves, we establish constructive ideas, creative ideas, and then we place them into mind action, the action of the mind. And we do that in treatment in science of mind, also called affirmative prayer. And then we release them, and when we release them, we release them in complete acceptance and trust in that power in the universe greater than I am that always delivers. Then we just go about our business. And sometimes that can be the harder part for some of us. Go about our business and do what is ours to do, knowing truth is revealing. And we, at the same time, must give ourselves the necessary time and humanity to go into the inner sanctuary and listen. Ernest Holmes talks about each of us acting out a role in the great drama of life, as he calls it. So let's think about that, the great drama of life. We've all watched movies, whether on TV or our own personal videos or at the theater. And when we watch a movie, we are very often swayed and moved, especially our feelings are tapped into if it's something really funny or something really sad. We can move, be moved to laughter or tears, and that's because the actors have convinced us that the event is really occurring when in truth, it really is not occurring. Likewise, we must believe in the part that we play in life, the part of love, of goodness, and not allow the tailor to dress us. Yeah, so it's all about letting your heart, your inner wisdom, or your voice of intuition be your guide. Physiologically, we know that the ears allow us to relate to the world around us, and the inner ear assists us in maintaining balance. Similarly, spiritually, the, metaph the metaphorical inner ear allows us to listen to that still small voice inside, and that creates a, a sense of balance for us, spiritual balance. The outer ear is of little value spiritually, and can often be um, detrimental as we are constantly receiving overpowering opinions and advice from others. And a lot of people think they know better about what is ours to do than we do. There's a lot of pushing and pulling going on from others. It's important to maintain a proper balance between our physical self and our spiritual self. It's important to remember that within is where we find our center. It's important to observe the world and learn and experience from the world around us 
and it's even more important for us to realize what exactly is ours to do. We find that within. We must maintain a solid core or a balance like a gyroscope or a top. You know, when they start spinning around, if you push them around, they'll come right back up to their center again. You remember, you remember the weebles? Weebles wobble, but they don't <coughs> fall down. You could play with those weebles, and they would always come back up. They'd always come back and find their center. I think maybe it's important that we be spiritual weebles. I like that, finding our balance. And in that balance, there are some key words for me. When I know, and I know that I know, that I'm listening to intuition, it's a natural state of being. It's of nature because that is what we are born in the image and likeness of. It feels genuine and authentic. And that's when we know that we are there, that the intuition is what is guiding and speaking to us about whatever decision is on our plate. There is a poem by an unknown author that I'm going to share with you. I thought it spoke beautifully to this idea of nature being our heart song. A man whispered, Creator, speak to me. And a meadowlark sang, but the man did not hear. So the man yelled, Universe, speak to me. And the thunder rolled across the sky. But the man did not listen. The man looked around and said, Let me see you. And a star shined brightly in the night sky. But the man did not see it. And the man shouted, Show me a miracle. And a life was born. But the man did not notice. So the man cried out in despair, touch me and let me know you are here. Whereupon the great mystery of the universe touched the man, but the man brushed the butterfly away and walked on. When I read that, I thought to myself, how often do I do that? How often am I so busy looking at the appearances around me that I forget to get quiet within and touch that part of me that is my authentic self? And when I thought that, I thought, well, if that's true for me, it can't just be true for me. Someone else must be able to relate to that idea that it's time to spend more time. Is that the role in thunder? Motorcycle. Motorcycle. It was the rolling thunder. <laughs> it's got an expression driving down the road. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's about listening to that intuition, that divine intuition within ourselves. Now, I had to go and get this we believe statement because I remembered and I thought to myself, you know, I know that listening to that genuine, authentic self within is when I make my best choices. But I know Ernest Holmes knew it also because he made it one of our We Believe statements. You will recognize it. I believe in the direct revelation of truth through the intuitive and spiritual nature of the individual and that any person may be a revealer of truth who lives in close contact with the indwelling God. That is what we're talking about. Knowing so completely that no one can shake our conviction in who and what God is and how it operates. And we absolutely know and practice until we get it instilled in us for every time that it is within us. Our divine intuition is our guide, our godness. Intuition is God in us. And intuition has often been called the GPS of the soul. So don't miss out on the blessings. 
You know, in Science of Mind, we don't usually tell people what to think. We say we don't teach people what to think, we teach people how to think. Or we teach people the importance of thinking in the first place. And so I'm not going to tell you you have to think about this, but I'm wanting to very strongly suggest these are some things you may want to think about. You are a unique, individualized expression of the divine. You are a perfect idea in the mind of God that has become manifest. Think about that. Use that as an affirmation, maybe even as a mantra. There's something about you that only you can be, that only you can do, that only you can express. And do you know what that is? Ooh, if you don't know, you need to listen to that still small voice. You need to go within, find your center, find your balance, and define <coughs> what is it that I am to do that nobody else on this planet can do. What is the perfect image of God showing up through me as me into the whole world? Because, you know, after all, without you, the full luster of divinity can't be experienced or displayed in the world. Yeah, I like that because it makes me think of art. And each one of us is a magnificent work of art. As you were talking about that, David, I was thinking how, you know, sometimes we know just what we want to do and be and how we want to show up, what we want to do, how we want to spend our time. And yet sometimes that changes over time. Evolution. As we grow, so do our desires grow. And that's fantastic and incredible. So I think of, of works of art and the different ways that we can relate to them and share them. I came up with a list, but maybe you're already getting your own list. Things like sculpting, painting. The first one I thought of was molding clay because sometimes when I am looking to make a shift in my life, I, I don't do it. I imagine, my imagination is very wild. I imagine myself molding clay into a certain symbol that represents something for me in life that triggers for me a reminder of who I want to be, what I want to do. Maybe glass blowing or molding gold or silver. Maybe yours is more of dancing, dancing through life or singing through life, or being the choreographer of the dance, being the maestro of the music, the songwriter. Maybe it's photographs. Maybe you like photography and you take pictures of things that inspire you and motivate you. Whatever it is, you are the artist. You are the designer. You are crafting the art and you own the copyright. So be sure you pick out your own suit. Don't let others tell you how to show up.